So thank you. Um, my name is Caitlin Tibbetts. I'm going to be talking today about relating water permeability to electrical resistivity and chloride penetrability of concrete containing different um, SEM materials. And I just want to first acknowledge the other authors from this publication, uh, Jerry Paris, Chris Ferraro, who's here today, Kyle Writing, and Tim Townsend. So first I'm going to talk about a brief background on these electrical test methods and water permeability test methods. Um, you know, as we've discussed in the, the other presentations, especially the first one, uh, we've kind of covered the basics of the electrical test methods. Uh, these will lead into the objective of the research, then I'll discuss briefly the materials and methods used for this study before going into the results and the conclusions. And finally, the implications and the ongoing research at the University of Florida. So a little bit of background. The main motivation of measuring these transport properties is that they're a good indicator of concrete durability. And this is important, you know, for several reasons. The degradation processes are usually due to some type of penetrability or ingress of water or aggressive species into the concrete. So these are, you know, corrosion, freeze thaw, alkali silica reactivity. Obviously, corrosion is of primary concern in Florida, um, as you can see in the picture here. And when we're measuring these transport properties, it's really important to understand the role of these SEMs, especially as the concrete industry continues to evolve. And we're use, constantly using new materials, new mixture designs. So it's really important to understand how that's affected. And like I said, the test methods that we use for the study are electrical test methods for estimating penetrability as well as pressurized water permeability. So the electrical test methods that we use are ASTM C1202 and the ASHDO standards for surface and bulk resistivity. Again, these were covered um, in the first presentation. He did a good job. Um, and the standards are there for reference. And basically all of these methods provide an indirect measurement of penetrability and require care for specimen conditioning to have consistent saturation and temperature for measurements. And they're also influenced by connectivity of the pore solution as well as the bulk matrix. So certain admixtures, uh, steel reinforcement can influence the results. Looking at water permeability test methods, there really isn't a consensus standard um, so many researchers have developed their own test method, which makes it a little bit more difficult in comparing. However, the majority are uniaxial pressurized systems that measure the flow rate after achieving steady state condition. And these provide a direct measurement of penetrability. The cons here are, again, specimen conditioning, especially the saturation level is important. And the length of test um, can be long, especially for low permeability concrete that requires a while to reach that steady state condition. So the objective of this research was to investigate the relationship between these methods for a broad range of SEMs to really be able to determine the reliability of using these electrical test methods for estimating penetrability of concrete containing alternative SEMs. For the mixtures used, we had 19 concrete mixtures uh, with nine cementitious materials. So we had type 1, 2 Portland cement, um, class F and class C fly ash, silica fumes, slag cement, metacholin, which aside from class C fly ash are all pretty much used in industry. And then we had these alternative SEMs of ground glass and a couple types of sugarcane bagasse ash. All of the mixtures investigated had a water to cementitious ratio of 0 0.37. And for the experimental setup, again, we did surface and bulk resistivity. The cylinders were kept submerged in saturated lime water until the time of testing. Um, and the ends were ground. There was a question earlier about bulk resistivity, and that just makes it easier for us. We use cloth squares um, as a conductive medium. For chloride ion penetrability, or uh, 1202, the specimens were vacuum saturated according to the conditioning procedure in the method and the test was run for the six hours at 60 volts per the method. Pore solution expression was done um, on cementitious paste specimens which were vacuum sealed in bags until the time of testing. 
And for the water permeability setup, we used a setup um, shown here that was developed at the University of Florida. It's a uniaxial flow system. The sides of the specimen are sealed with epoxy and we use the same vacuum saturation procedure as ASTM 1202 with a testing pressure of 85 PSI. And a reference cell without a specimen was used to account for any temperature and evaporation fluctuations during the testing. Um, and the flow rate was measured from these manometer tubes here. So the first thing we looked at was the relationship between the surface and bulk resistivity, which is pretty well established. And you can see a very strong correlation. This represents all SEMs, um, all mixtures and all testing ages. We did see the differences in puzzlonic reactivity. Uh, silica fume reacted quickly, fly ash um, was delayed, but continued to gain resistivity over time. And the geometry factor or the slope here of about 1.9 was consistent for all SEM types and ages um, and consistent with the Morris factors for a four by eight cylinder. So next we compared these to the chloride ion penetrability or total charge passed um, from the 1202 test. And again, we see a strong correlation and agreement with Ohm's law where you can predict the total charge given the bulk resistivity and testing parameters. And basically from looking at these test methods, all of the electrical test methods provided consistent penetrability ratings. So now when moving into looking at water permeability and these electrical test methods, we first looked at comparing water permeability to surface resistivity. And we saw a trend of increasing resistivity with decreasing water permeability but this was for the more traditional SEMs, so the fly ash, silica fume, slag, maniculin. And we started to see differences based on the SE, SEM type, particularly for the alternative SEMs. So for the sugarcane and ground glass SEMs, as shown in the second plot here, you could see that there wasn't much change in electro, electrical resistivity over time, although there were decreases in water permeability. So the electrical resistivity just remains uh, fairly low and classified as like very high penetrability while the water permeability continued to decrease. Now comparing the water permeability to chloride ion penetrability, um, or again the 1202 test, we looked at the traditional SEMs and see that there is a pretty good relationship and it would be as we would expect, lower water permeability corresponds with lower total charge pass or lower penetration. But when we looked at the sugarcane and ground glass, again, they behaved differently. Um, there wasn't a good relationship and they were much higher than the traditional SEMs. So kind of putting this together, again, we see that for the sugarcane and ground glass, there were higher CIP values than mixtures with other comparable water permeability. So it's clearly something else is affecting the measurements here. But when looking at just the traditional SEMs, um, which is the solid line um, and the solid points here, it has a pretty good relationship. So the regression line for the traditional SEMs was used to kind of find equivalent classification thresholds for penetrability. So you can see horizontal lines here dividing up the plot into the region that classifies as high, moderate, low, and very low penetrability um, based on the 1202 standard. And then we basically took the intersection of that regression line for those to come up with equivalent empirical water permeability values. So this gave us kind of an idea of some ranges of water permeability that corresponded to these um, established chloride ion penetrability classifications. And again, since the sugarcane and ground glass were kind of identified as outliers, we looked to poor solution analysis to investigate it further. So looking at the poor solution here, um, we have our different mixes, we measured the pH and conductivity, and we see that the ground glass had the highest conductivity of all the specimens investigated. And so the low electrical resistivity and high kind of total charge pass is attributed to this high alkali content. So as mentioned in the first presentation with the formation factor, 
um, and how that can account for some of these discrepancies and influencing factors of um, surface resistivity or just electrical test methods in general. We see here that that's very important. But when looking at the sugarcane bagasse ash, it had relatively low connectivity of the pore solution. So that combined with the comparable water permeability that we saw, we concluded that there was actually electrically conductive bulk material or in the kind of hardened um, paste matrix. The sugar cane that was used had very high LOI values, um, up to 42%. Um, and so we got this material um, from the plant and we didn't do any post-processing on it. We wanted to test it as is um, and see what the properties were. So this high LOI um, is attributed to the unburnt carbon that's in the system. And this is what was causing high connectivity in the bulk matrix, which in effect gave us these low electrical resistivity and high total charge passed. So in conclusion, you know, these electrical test methods, um, they're quick, they're easy, um, but they're not appropriate for all concrete containing, alt especially alternative SEMs. So we saw that conductive constituents from alternative SEMs can result in misclassification of penetrability when using these methods. And this was seen with the sugarcane bagasse ash and the ground glass specifically. And this increased penetrability can either be due to the increased alkalis within the pore solution, which was seen for the ground glass, or presence of actual conductive solids in the hardened concrete matrix, which was the case for the sugarcane. On the other hand, the concrete containing the more traditional SEMs um, behaved as we would expect, um, and we had increasing electrical resistivity corresponding to that decreasing water permeability. Um, the final conclusions were that since the water permeability was unaffected by these electrically conductive components in the pore solution or the bulk matrix, we're able to kind of um, decipher the actual contribution from the sugarcane and what was going on. And the geometric correction factor between the surface and bulk resistivity um, was unaffected by the SEM types for this study. So the implications for this research is that when having increased use of these alternative SEMs combined with increased use of electrically based test methods, it makes it important to really understand the factors that are influencing these. And as we use more waste materials um, in concrete as uh, supplementary cementitious materials, they might not meet the current electrical thresholds, but actually have adequate penetrability. For ongoing research, um, University of Florida is continuing to do durability testing on concrete containing alternative SEMs. And we are also working on the water permeability test method set up itself, um, making modifications with increased vacuum saturation as well as increased pressure uh, to reduce the length of the test and using smaller manometer tubes for better precision when using a uh, low flow or low permeability concrete. And finally, I'd like to just acknowledge uh, the Florida Department of Transportation for funding this research, especially Dr. DeFord, who is the project manager, and then some personnel at the University of Florida that helped with testing. Um, if you're interested in more details regarding this work, it is published and the information is here and you can always uh, feel free to contact me. So with that, that is the end of my presentation. Um, I'll leave it here in case you want to see my contacts um, and thank you for your attention. Uh, I, I think there's, there is one question in the Q&A window, uh, Caitlin. If, if you wanted to take that, uh, just answer it right now or you can, you can answer it via chat, uh, whichever you prefer. Another question, can we apply your correlation if we use the same synthetious materials without taking into account other parameters, namely the aggregates? Um, so that's a good question. And the idea for this research was to kind of provide a starting point and also to look at any influencing factors and outliers. Um, so obviously we saw that with SEMs, um, aggregates would be another factor um, and the paper um, gives the full details of the aggregates and the mixed designs, if you're curious. Um, but definitely additional mixed designs with different aggregates, different water cement ratios,
could refine this relationship. And this was kind of presented as a starting point to, to elaborate on. And did we use air and treatment? And if not, do you test the trapped air content in your mixtures? Um, yes, yeah, so we did measure the air content in the mixtures. Um, and I believe that is in the paper. Um, we didn't really use air entrainment. That's not typical in Florida mixtures. 